All right. Awesome, awesome. Guys, I want to welcome you if you're just tuning in to my weekly Friday night wealth creation course. We do these every Friday. If you guys are just tuning in for the first time, my name is Jerry. I'm the owner and founder of a company called Wealth Dynamics, and we help families become financially educated and wealthy so that they can navigate their economic futures with certainty and help build more, build more prosperous communities around them. And so what I want to share with you guys tonight is going to be something to do with solvency. Now, for those of you guys that have watched this before, I want to thank you for coming back again. We do a free course every single Friday, every single Friday for free on the topic of personal finances. So we've got Instagram here. We've got Facebook. We've got Zoom. This goes up on uh, you know, YouTube, all of our, our different platforms and stuff. And um, the topic this week is phase one of financial freedom. Okay, phase one of financial freedom. Last week, we covered phase zero of financial free freedom, which was really, you know, handling the past. What do I do to get out of debt? What do I do to make sure I'm actually in control of my money? Um, a lot of our basics were covered on that course. Tonight's going to be the next level, right? Solvency, actually having money and a foundation to start building off of. Now, a little bit about my background. Um, I've been in the financial industry for almost a decade now. So I own a company called Wealth Dynamics, and, and what we do is we help people with money. We help families, individuals, business owners, um, you know, ultimately become financially free, but also achieve all of the steps prior to financial freedom. Okay, so I've been doing this for about a decade now, and uh, one of the things that I've observed and learned that I really want to share with you guys tonight is the importance of being solvent. Okay, and I'm going to go over what that means. Okay, the importance of being solvent. Now, give you guys a little bit of context. When I first got interested in money, uh, I started to look at, all right, well, who, who is rolling? Who's balling? Who's wealthy? I want to see that. And I want to go watch what those people are doing. Right. And I started seeing them doing things with investments. And I started seeing them doing things with debt and taxes and all of this really interesting stuff. And I thought that that was what I was going to do. Okay. Now, it reminds me when I was a kid, I, I, when I was probably three or four years old, um, maybe even younger than that, maybe two or three years old, I was at my grandma's house. We're on a lake. She lives on a lake and I'm on the dock, right? And I see my sister, who's probably 14 years old, swimming in the lake. And I see my sister out there, and I'm like, out there swimming and I'm like, man, that looks awesome. I want to swim too. And I jumped in the water and promptly began to drown. Okay. <laughs> That's a real story. I didn't think about how does she get out there? Do I know how to swim? Have I been in the water this deep before? Have I jumped off a dock? Do I know how to handle it? None of that crossed my mind. I just jumped off the dock into the water and immediately started sinking to the bottom and drowning. Luckily, my sister dove down and saved me, right? I share this story with you because it might be a funny story or it might be a cute story, whatever you want to call it. It might be a dumb story, but it relates to what happens oftentimes when people see wealthy people other individuals that are swimming in the deep end of the financial pool. And we're like, man, I want to do that. I was just texting a lady today and she's like, Hey, can you help me with business credit? This particular person already has a lot of personal credit card debt. And I was like, Hey, definitely after we pay off all your credit card debt, after we help build up six months of reserves so that you're solvent after you fund your sacred account. And after you've got a couple investments under your belt so that you're getting paid passive income every month, then I'll help you get business credit. Because I'm not going to help you get six figures in business debt when you've got five figures in personal debt, zero figures in your bank account, and your, your income is not exceeding your, your expenses. That's not a game we want to play. So there's this thing called solvency. Now, before I dive into this, guys, I want to go ahead and lay some ground rules like I always do. If you guys are just tuning in, thank you. Um, so questions, post those. I love to answer questions. So if you have questions, drop them in the comments. I want to answer them. Um, I will typically answer them at the very end. So if you drop a question down, I don't get to it right away. I'm not ignoring you um, unless it's inappropriate or dumb. Then I'm definitely ignoring you. Uh, but if it was a good question, I'm going to get to it at the end, right? And secondarily, um, no negativity on, on our feeds. These are th This is a Friday night. Just think about the context here. It's a Friday night. Most people are out partying, drinking, watching Netflix, all sorts of stupidity. And there is a small group of people that is on this feed tonight that wants to improve their finances. And they're dedicating their Friday night to improving their finances. I commend you if you're that individual. You're freaking awesome. You're why I do what I do. I love helping people like you. So to be negative and critical when that person is seriously investing their time 
is a no-go. Like you would just get kicked off the feed. We don't want any of that. Like we won't even acknowledge that you're there. That's how bad it is, right? That's the corporal crime. So like respect other people, don't be negative. If you've got questions, post those. Um, and then secondly, this is the topic of money, right? Money is something that when I talk to people, generally speaking, most people say, man, I've never understood money. It's so confusing. And money is just math. I've not met someone yet that doesn't understand math. Everyone understands math. The only time money gets complex and complicated is when we enter vocabulary into the equation. Okay. Who remembers taking algebra? Numbers were easy till they started inserting letters in the numbers. And then you're like, what the hell? I have no idea what any of this means. Okay. Money is the same way. So if at any point you start feeling like I lost you or you don't know what's going on or I'm over your head or your eyes glaze over, or you start getting bored. There's some piece of vocabulary that I said that you didn't see the math behind. And that doesn't make you wrong. It makes me wrong. It means that I spoke too complexly. I need to be more simple. Okay. So if there's something where you're like, Hey, can you backtrack? I didn't get that. Literally just drop that in the comments. I'll stop, pause. We'll go back to it. Cause the chances are, if you misunderstood it, so did everybody else. And you might just be the brave enough one to speak up that helps everybody. Okay. So that's what I want to get off uh, on, on house rules first. Okay. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is solvency. Solvency, right? What is solvency? Solvency means that I have actual like value. I'm not in a deficit with my finances. Last week we talked about, all right, what if I don't earn more money than I'm, than I spent? That's not solvency. That's a problem, right? What if I have extremely high debt? That's not solvency. That's actually financial past that I'm handling. What if I'm overpaying for things and I don't know how to control my budget? That's not solvency. That's again, a financial behavior from the past that I've got to control. We talked about all of that stuff. Okay. Last week. So this week we're talking about solvency. And I, I, I talk about last week briefly because last week is the prior step to this week. We cannot have the discussion of solvency if we're still living in the past, if we've still got debt, if we're still not earning more than we're spending, if we still have to go and live on government subsidies because we're not bringing enough income in. So solvency is the conversation after that. Okay. So we're not going to skip that. We're just, we already addressed it last week. This week is the next topic of solvency. Okay. When I think solvency, I'm going to give you guys some practical examples. When I think solvency, I think I earn more than I spent. Okay. Notice that I did not say I spend less than I earn. I said, I earn more than I spend two different mindsets there. Right. So I earn more than I spend. Okay. My assets exceed my liabilities. The things that I own are greater in value than the things that I owe. That's what that means. Okay. And then lastly, I am able to pay all of my obligations no matter what. Okay. When you think solvency, I want you to think about 2020. I want you to think about the year 2020. Some of these big companies in March, April, May, June, July, some of them even in August that are freaking listed on the New York Stock Exchange and going out of business. That is the opposite of solvency. That, that means that they didn't have money to cover a month worth of bills if revenue didn't show up. That means that their assets didn't exceed their liabilities. That means that they were not earning more than they were spending. That's not solvency. Solvency means that I have all of those things done. Now, the thing is that solvency sounds really boring. Okay. Solvency sounds really boring. It's not a thing where you're like, man, I can't wait to have solvency. Like you don't see Robert Kiyosaki and Grant Cardone out there touting solvency. They're talking, you know, debt and passive income and all this really sexy sounding stuff. But what they don't tell you is when they were 30 years old, they built financial solvency. Before they started, they built financial solvency. Grant Cardone, Robert Kiyosaki, all of these guys that we, we see online and we're like, man, I want to be like that. Guarantee you they've got more than six months of cash in the bank right now. Guarantee you their assets exceed their liabilities. Guarantee you they make sure they earn more than they spend. And they did that long enough to where they started to actually build up some excess that they could invest. And then when they started investing, they started then getting passive income. And then they could say, hey, look at this check. It showed up last month. I didn't do anything for it. That's passive income. We see the passive income and we're like, man, that's cool. That's dope. We don't see, okay, but prior to that, that means that they had a hundred grand or more probably in cash that they put into that deal. Prior to having a hundred grand or more, they had enough money every month that they could save and get to a hundred grand. Prior to having enough money left over to save to get to a hundred grand, they had enough reserves to cover their expenses so that they could feel comfortable investing a hundred K and not being broke because they could still cover their expenses for several months if something happened. Prior to that, 
they had income exceeding their expenses so they could get there in the first place. Prior to that, they probably had no debt. They didn't have a car payment and a credit card and a student loan and medical debt and, and, and taxes and all this stuff we have. And prior to that, they understood how to earn income and be responsible and not have to live off of uh, government subsidies or credit cards or any of these things that hold us back financially. That's all the stuff we overlook. But we see the Facebook ad or the YouTube ad and we're like, that's dope. I want that. We miss all of the prior steps, which is not the stuff they talk about because they know that that's not exciting. Little, did it, little do they know you actually want to know that. That's why I'm sharing it because I know from experience, the people watching the stream actually do want to know, okay, but how do I get there? What do I actually do? Okay, what are the things that I actually start to do in order and what's the plan look like? That's solvency. So that's what we're talking about tonight. And there are steps to getting there. Okay. Now, before we talk about the steps, I want to talk about the benefits of it. Who has ever been stressed out because they lost their job? Okay. I want to see some emojis if that's you. If you've been stressed out because you lost your job or your business wasn't producing the way that it used to and you didn't know if you could make payroll or pay bills or there was a really big expense or an emergency that came up and you didn't know if you had enough money to cover it. Who's been there? I've been there more times than I can count. Okay. Imagine never having to worry about that ever again. Okay. Just picture like be in that moment really quick. Imagine never having to have that fear in your gut where you're like, crap, crap, crap. How am I going to pay for this? Never having that again. Like it's just not even a consideration in your life. That is the result of having six months of expenses and reserves in your sacred account. So that would be one of the moves we use for solvency. Okay. Now it's not exciting because it's going to take a while maybe to get six months of reserves or that six months is not going towards an investment right now or whatever our, our excuse is, but think about that. Okay. Let me pitch you another one. Okay. Who has ever had so much debt that they felt like they were running on a treadmill that was moving faster than they could go? Anybody? I've been there too. Okay. <laughs> I'm not immune from these things. I've done all of this stuff before. Okay. Where my, my credit card payment or my car payment, my debt payments were so high that I felt like I could barely tread water. Who's ever been there? Okay. That is the result of insolvency. Okay. Now picture never having to worry about that again, never having to put money towards credit cards, never having to worry about the car payment, never having to worry about the student loan or the tax bill or the whatever that you've got to pay. That is the result of not having debt. Okay, now there is a Robert Kiyosaki fan watching here with his fingers over the keyboard that's about to say, leverage is good. We're not talking about investment debt. We're talking about consumer debt. We're talking about debt that costs us, not debt that pays us. Okay, those are two different types of behaviors. So we're saying the car the car does not make you money, okay? We're saying the college loan. The college loan didn't make you any money. We're saying the medical debt. We're saying the tax debt. We're saying the, the credit card payment. Like that's not debt that makes us money. So we wanna get rid of that, okay? I talked to a client today. Um, we went over his savings rate. What percentage of your gross income are you saving? That was one of the, the stats that we covered. And, and not to, this is not to make fun of him or anything because I've been here and I've seen so many people here and it's crazy that this happens, but he was only able to save 2% of his income, okay? And on this call, I also showed him what percentage of his income is going to banks in the form of loan payments, 50%. 50% of this guy's income was going to pay debt and he only had 2% left. Okay. There's something to be said for behavior and education and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, the bank is not your friend. The bank knows that this is the case. The bank knows that you don't understand these things. The bank knows that it, when you get in, you can't get out. And so they want you in because they know they're going to get as much of your income as they possibly can for the rest of your life. They've done this for over a century, guys, in our country. They've done this in every country in existence for thousands of years. So when you get rid of that, that's solvency. I don't have to worry about debt anymore. I can save for this guy. I can save 50% of my income. Imagine that you make 10 grand, boom, five of it's mine. How great would that feel? Right. And then last one, this one is a good one. Who's ever closed a sale before? Any sale doesn't, doesn't mean that you're a killer in sales. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you joined an MLM and you signed your mom up and you closed a fail sale. Who has ever felt that feeling of like when you close a deal and you're just like, oh, that was awesome. Like it feels so good. Okay. It's just this exhilaration. Like you help someone and they're excited and you're excited and they're going to make money and you're going to make money. And it's this great feeling. 
that is the feeling of creating your own income. That's a factor in financial solvency. Okay, now on the flip side, who has ever just felt like they were drudging along at their job, trading time for money and waiting for Friday and waiting for it to be five so they can clock out and it's not really exciting to be there, but you got to make a living somehow. And so we come up with cute little phrases like working hard or hardly working, right? That's not being in control of your income. That's actually an insolvent thing. I'm trading my time for money. That could go away anytime. That could disappear. We just saw that disappear for, for millions of people this year. So when I'm talking about solvency, I've got to have control of my income. If I don't have control of my income, solvency is not going to be real for me. When I'm talking solvency, I've got to have no consumer debt. If I, don't have, if I have consumer debt, I'm not solvent because the bank gets more of my money than I do. Okay, I've got to have assets that exceed my liabilities so that if the worst case scenario happened, I'm not broke. I've got to have reserves so that if I did lose my job or my business did take a hit, I don't have to go take government cheese to stay in. When I say government cheese, I mean subsidy programs, loans. Guys, all of these loans, guess what? Those are funded by tax dollars. We're all fighting over Joe Biden and Donald Trump right now. The freaking central bank is in the background ramping up your taxes and inflation regardless of who gets elected. Not to get political, but I'm going to real quick because that's the reality. Until we fix that, doesn't matter who's in office. So when we talk solvency, like this is really the focus of it. And I'm going to talk tonight about the steps to get there. Okay. So what I want to do really quick is I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to go over how to become financially solvent. How do we get there? What are the exact steps? What does it look like? This is not esoteric concepts. Esoteric means special concepts. Um, let me actually highlight my, my video screen for Zoom really quick so you guys aren't just looking at the WDX camera spotlight video. There we go. Um, that's probably much better. So this is not just specialized concepts that are theoretical. We actually want to show you guys how do we build real life solvency? How do we get there and what are the steps to make it happen? So last week, and I'm going to flip Instagram around so you guys can see this too. Okay, so last week, guys, we talked about phase zero. Okay, phase zero, gaining financial freedom from the past in order to have the ability to create a future. So we talked about how to control our income expenses, how to become educated on how money works. We talked about how to earn income, how to pay off debt, how to make sure that we're credit worthy, all of those things. This week, we're talking about gaining present time financial solvency in order to have assets that exceed liabilities and the ability to pay all obligations. Okay. This is a PAC statement, gaining present time financial solvency. This means that I am operating, flip Instagram back around. This means that I'm operating with my finances in present time. Meaning if I have debt, I'm not operating in present time. I'm paying for the past. I can't be in present time when I have debt because that happened last year and I'm still paying for it every month. Okay, the car that I signed up for on an eight year note and I'm on year five, that was a five years ago problem that I'm still paying for today out of my income. So I get out of debt, so I'm in present time with my finances. That's an important thing. Then I start building assets. Assets are things that I own. I'm building up things that I own and I am making sure, I'm making sure that I own more things that I owe by paying off the debt and building assets. I'm making that equation work. And then I'm securing the ability to pay all of my obligations. Okay. At this point in time, when we say obligations, we're really not talking about debt anymore. If we paid off debt, that's not on the table. We're talking about what are our other obligations? Okay. First one, if I earned income, I'm obligated towards taxes. I don't agree with taxes, but it doesn't mean we're going to not pay them. We've got to figure out, you know, there's legal and ethical and responsible ways to handle that. But ultimately, if I owe taxes, I owe taxes. I've got to make sure I can pay that. Okay. I don't want to end up owing the IRS money and have them be my collection agency. What would be another obligation? My, my housing. So whether that's a mortgage or that's rent, uh, I'm obligated to eat. I need to buy food. So that's a thing. I've got transportation. I need to be able to pay that. I need to be, I can't go to work naked. So I need clothing. That's an obligation, right? Um, I can't be dead. So I need to make sure I'm healthy. That's also an obligation, right? I can't be a dumbass. So I need to be educated. That's also an obligation. These are all the things that I want to make sure I can pay for. Okay. The first line of defense is my income. If I earn income, then I can pay for these things. But what about if my income leaves, right? How do I pay for obligations if my income temporarily left, meaning I lost the job or the business doesn't work anymore or whatever's going on? This is where reserves come in, right? Reserves mean I have money saved up. Okay. Now the problem here with money saved up is 
when we get here where we can start saving, um, the way that our economy works, savers get penalized. Inflation, right? We all know that a dollar, you know, 10 years ago was worth more than a dollar today. So if I'm saving, the rate of inflation, historically speaking, the true rate of real inflation is about 5% per year. 5% per year, which means that if I'm keeping cash in the bank, I am paying 5% per year to have money. Just do the easy math on that. If I've got 100,000 in the bank, that's five grand every single year that I keep that 100 grand in the bank. Okay, and I'm, and I'm not able to write that loss off on my taxes. That's just inflation. So there's this tension between I need to have solvency because if my income leaves, I've got to have reserves because that's my second line of defense. However, the place that I store my reserves currently loses money. 5% a year. That's actually money is an asset, but it acts like a liability. It goes down in value. So it's costing. It's kind of like having a credit card at 5%. Every year, I'm going to pay five grand in interest by the loss of my purchasing power. So what do we do to fix that? So who's ever heard the phrase, it's not just what you make, it's what you keep? True phrase. Very true phrase. Very true. I'm not going to say it's not. But I'm going to add to it. It's not just what you keep. It's also where we keep it. So if I have money, but I keep it in a place that loses, how much good is it to me? Or if I have money, but I keep it in a place that I can't touch till I'm 60 and I'm currently 28, how much good is it to me? Or if I have money and I put it in a place where it could literally get lopped in half in, a, in, in, in an instant in the stock market, how much good is it to me? It's not there to do its job. It's like, it's like hiring an employee and then that employee is not actually on post doing the job you paid them for. Who would be pissed if you had an employee and you found out that that was the case? You hired them to be the front desk girl and the front desk girl you know, goes into the bathroom and smokes cigarettes and, and plays on Facebook all day instead of doing the thing you hired her for. You'd fire that employee. So you're hiring your bank right now to keep your money safe and they're not doing that. They're consistently losing 5% of it every single year. It's consistent. I'll give them that, right? But that's not what we're looking for. We want consistent safety and improvement. So instead of the bank, we use the sacred account, okay? For those of you that don't know, the sacred account, it's a life insurance policy. Um, it's got a high cash value, meaning I put money into it. I can pull most of my money right back out again. And it's going to grow my money at a 3 to 5% tax-free rate. You know, you say three to 5%, but I thought inflation was five. So if I'm making five and it's costing me five, then I'm not making anything. Or if I'm only making three and it's costing five, I'm losing two. Yeah, but right now you're in the bank. You're losing five no matter what. So if we can shorten that down to two or zero. That's better than guaranteed loss of five. There's not another place to put money until we start getting into investing. That's going to pay you more than 5%. So you need to have enough money to be able to invest. And where are we going to store that? We're going to store it in the place that minimizes losses. Because here's the other thing about the bank, guys. They're losing 5%, that piddly little 0.10% interest that you get paid on them. You're going to pay taxes on that too. Believe it or not, right? Like if, if you're, if you're uh, 100 grand in the bank, okay, 0.10% is 10% of 1%. So 1% of 100,000 is $1,000. 10% of $1,000 is 100 bucks. You get a hundred grand in the bank, they're going to pay you a hundred bucks in interest and you're going to pay taxes on the hundred dollars while they lost 5%. That's not a good business model for you. So the sacred account is where you're going to build your solvency. So on this step, we're working towards the first target, which is one month of expenses and cash. Okay. The goal is six, but the first target is one month of expenses in cash. This one, I actually would put in cash. This is our fast money, right? So if I, if my, if my six months of expenses total out to be a hundred grand, which they don't, but let's say they did. And, and I said, okay, I need six months in reserves and I'm going to have one of those months in cash. That means that I have about $8,300 of this, this hundred grand just in cash. I'm okay losing 5% on $8,300 and only making 80 bucks on it. That's fine with me, right? Or $8 on it. I'm okay with that because that's basically like quick money. If something big happens and I need, you know, eight grand really fast, I can grab that. The other five months I'm keeping in my sacred account. Okay. Five months of the reserves in my sacred account. The reason being is it's going to help me outpace inflation. The sacred account is tax-free. And when I access money from the sacred account, they still pay me as if I never took the money out. So again, with the bank, they're losing 5%. They're paying us 0.10%. And then when we take the money out, they don't keep paying us. That's done. Like we broke the cycle. There's no more interest being earned. If I'm using the sacred accounts, 
I'm making three to five. Okay, I'm not paying taxes. And when I pull my money out, they still pay me the three to five as if it never left. I like that. That's why I put five months of my reserves in the sacred account. Okay. Now, this is going to be a new mindset, but when you get to six months in reserves, I want you to equate that to zero. What I mean is that is your new zero. You never go below six months in reserves. If you have only six months in reserves, it's the equivalent of having zero dollars to your name. That's the mindset I want you to have because it's, there's, there's going to be times where people are like, you know, you should pay for this car or go on this trip or buy this timeshare or donate to this thing. And you're going you're gonna to maybe be broke. And then you're like, oh, wait, I have six months in cash. I could use that. <laughs> Duh. Why don't I just use my six months in cash? No, you're broke. That six months is for your reserves. You don't touch it. Okay, like, like that would be considered stealing from your family's security if you use that money for other things. So that's your new zero. You're just going to sit on that, okay? And it's going to grow in the sacred account. If you never use it, at least it's growing there. You probably will use it here and there. But that's going to help you from ever going in credit card to get debt again. You'll never go in credit card debt again because you just borrow from yourself, okay? And it's also going to keep you solvent. Now, at this point in time, we also build out your blueprint. A blueprint is a financial plan. Now, the reason why I stress this on phase one is because prior to phase one, you don't really need one that much. We kind of know if you're prior to phase one, you need to go earn a paycheck and get your income up and you need to pay off your debt. Those are the things. Like We don't need an intricate plan to talk about that. We could just go do that, right? But on phase one, now we're talking about we're building solvency. Now I do need a plan because I'm starting to have things like taxes. How do I reduce those? Because I'm saving a lot of my money now and the IRS is going to want to keep some of that. How do I prevent that from happening? Where do I save it? How much do I save? And there's all these things we start measuring now. So we start building out your financial blueprint. We look at here's where your goals are. Here's where you're at. These are all of the steps you need to take to get there in order and we actually start tracking that with you at this point. Now, there's also going to be some education here. At this point in time, hopefully you've already gone through a lot of the stuff in Wealth Dynamics University. You understand money. You understand how it works. You understand about you know, paying off your debt. You know what the sacred account is. All of this stuff is, is known to you. The education we go through on phase one is education about the banking system and taxes, Okay, the reason why we need to educate in this position about the banking system and taxes is we need to understand why we're not putting our money in a bank. Okay, because that's going to be a temptation. Why do why would I like I have some people that are so ingrained in saving money in the bank that when they look at their their sacred account or their investments or their retirement, for them it feels like a loss to have to take the money out of the bank and put it in one of those vehicles instead. No, no, no. The loss is the money being in the bank. It's a guaranteed loss of five percent. So we need to understand. Why are, why are we not using the banking system? Okay, why is the banking system wrong? Why is it something we should be staying out of financially? Okay, now the other thing we're learning about here is taxes. Okay, who knew that you could legally reduce your taxes? Okay, I own a tax firm because of this very reason. Anyone that's ever worked with a CPA, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some fun here. What happens? You turn in your stuff. And you're like, oh, I have a CPA I'm taken care of. They're going to handle all of my tax planning. And you, you hand them your things and they're like, great, you owe this much. And you're like, what? And they're like, yeah, I took your stuff, your, your taxes say you owe this much. And then you're like, oh, crap, well, I can't not pay taxes. So I better pay this and I better pay it rapidly because I don't want to owe the IRS. Okay, that's wrong. That should never happen happen. If you have a CPA that's doing that, you need a new CPA. What should happen is you turn in your stuff and they look at this and they say, why are your taxes so high? And you say, well, I don't know. And they would say, well, I thought you were tracking this stuff. And they say, well, I wasn't. And they say, that's an issue. Let's teach you how to track it. Also, let's put an extension on your taxes because you're not ready to file them yet. You should not file your taxes owing this much money. Let's extend them till October and let's you and I figure out how we can reduce your tax bill. Okay, I just did this with a client of mine in New York. We're going to get him back over 10 grand because I sat down and said, hey, why are you paying taxes? You owed last year. You shouldn't have to pay out of pocket. You already paid enough. Let's figure out what went wrong, right? Uh, another client of mine, I'm going to get him back. Uh, I think three or four grand this year, same thing. We looked at, you made 111, 
if you would have made 105, your taxes would have gone from the 22% bracket down to the 12% bracket. Why did your CPA not tell you to spend six grand and save 12% of or 10% off of every dollar you earned? That makes no sense. Let's amend your taxes and let's handle this. That's the kind of education we're getting on the phase one of the blueprint because nobody teaches us this stuff. Nobody teaches us the tax code. Nobody teaches us banks. Nobody teaches us any of this. We just go to work, save our money, give it to the bank and pay our taxes like a good little citizen. And that's that, right? So phase one is really important to understand like we're past debt. We're past, you know, earning income. This is all stuff we're doing already. Now we're focused on what's the reality and the truth about some of these financial instruments that we've been taught are instruments of solvency when really they're not. The bank is not an in instrument of solvency for you and I. It might be for the bank, but not for me and you, right? So these are all things that, that we should be getting educated on. We don't, right? And then here's the other thing that's going to happen on phase one. On phase one, you're going to be very excited about your new financial journey because you're winning and none of your friends are going to be on that journey with you. So they're going to start thinking you're weird and wrong. And then you might even start thinking you're weird and wrong too, because your brother and your sister and your mom and your dad and your coworkers have no idea what the hell you're talking about because they were told to give the money to the bank and put it in the 401k and borrow on their credit card so they can maintain a good credit score and have a 30 year mortgage and all this stuff. And we're saying, no, don't do any of that. Okay. So this is phase one, step a getting six months in reserves, one of it's in cash, five of it's in the sacred account. And then we're starting to build our blueprint on what do we do to engineer financial success here? Okay, now phase B is income security. Now, this is another one that might seem boring when I talk about it, income security. We're gonna make sure that you are insured, okay? Now, when I say insured, all of the uh, antagonistic husbands are like, oh, I don't need that, I don't need that, I provide for my family. No, no, we're saying, you could self-insure for sure. But right now, if something happened, you would go broke. If you lost your income because you got disabled, you only have six months in the bank. So it's either that or food stamps. Which one? Let's pay 60 bucks and let's get long-term disability insurance so that that's never a problem again, right? Or let's make sure that you're covered on liability coverage on your house. Because if some little kid rolls his ankle in your backyard and their parents decide we're going to sue you and your insurance says, sorry, we cap out at 300 grand, you're kind of screwed. So let's insure against that, right? Also, let's make sure we're covering things like our life insurance, right? If you died, you are your asset in the family right now, they would be screwed and they would lose your earning power. Let's insure against that risk. Okay, insurance means that we're going to not only build wealth, but we're keeping and protecting it. Okay, so we wanna make sure that, you know, A, we're doing that the right way and we're doing it at the right time for the right time. Okay, so on phase 1B, we're covering, like it says here, proper, proper auto and home insurance coverage. Okay, you will not be my client. I will fire you as a client if you get in an accident and then call me and say, hey, I didn't have insurance on the car. Can you help me out? No, I can't help you out. You should have freaking paid a hundred bucks and had car insurance. That's not, that's not what I do for you. Okay, or, or you had something happen on your home and you're like, oh, it wasn't covered you should have had it covered. Or you're like, hey, I'm broke this year because I had to get a five grand dental operation. I have dental coverage. Get dental coverage. It's like 20 bucks a month, dude. What are you worried about, right? Or, or you know, you don't have life insurance. That's worse. You die and your wife and kids are screwed or your husband and kids are screwed. Like, I'm not gonna be able to help them. Like, you gotta make sure you cover your bases, be insured. Now, you don't need to own every insurance in the world. There are eight. There are eight of them at different times in your life. You'll need to own each of the eight. You probably don't need them all at once, but you do need to own the eight throughout the different courses of your life. So those are basic things we're covering. And really what this is doing, what this is doing is it's preventing you from ever being dependent on the government. Let me highlight this. Okay, so think about like when somebody has an incident happen and they don't have savings, Think about these businesses. What did they have to do? They had to go depend on the government. Guys, the government does not have revenue. They have taxation, which means you didn't depend on the government. You sucked income out of your fellow American citizens because of your lack of planning and responsibility. That's not cool, okay? So we're gonna make sure we insure against that, right? Or what happens if I get disabled and I can't work? 
You might say, well, that's what social security disability is for. Do you know how underfunded social security is right now? They don't have money to pay you disability insurance. So don't kid yourself and say, well, I'm getting social security disability. That thing is insolvent. They're actually taking that from debt, which is bad for all of us, and future taxation, which is bad for all of us. Okay, we're eliminating government dependency risk. You will never again be a financial victim to the government which they very much want. They want you to be a financial victim because that's how they can increase taxes. They want you to feel like you can't earn. They want you to feel like you can't save. They want you to feel like you can't get an education. They want you to feel like you can't do this and can't do that because that makes them more valuable. The more stuff you and I can't do, the more valuable a politician is to come in and say, I can do it when really he can't even do his own stuff. He couldn't figure out his own career path. So he had to be a professional politician. So we're not going to depend depend on the government. We're going to ensure so that these things don't come up. And this is a natural part of this. Now, a lot of us, when we hear the insurance thing, we're like, start freaking out and we're like, I don't want to pay premium costs. And I'm, I'm worried about this and that. Again, we're debt free. So you probably got 50% of your income back. So some of that money that we used to just throw down the toilet and give to banks, we're going to use that to protect your family. A couple hundred bucks of it, we're going to put towards things like life insurance and car insurance and the things that you should have as a responsible human being. And here's the great thing. When you're wealthy, you won't need any of those things. Okay. The reason we have insurance is we're renting someone else's wealth until we have some of our own. So I'm admitting, if I have, have to have insurance, I'm not wealthy for this thing yet. I couldn't just insure my entire house if it burned down. So I'm going to use home insurance until I can or I can't just fork out cash if I end up in the hospital. So I'm going to rent wealth from the insurance company for my health until I can. Or if I died, my family would not be generationally wealthy yet. So I'm going to insure temporarily until that is reality. And then once I'm covered there, I'm going to get rid of it. So the main ones here, we're looking at disability insurance. That's insuring loss of income for disability. When I'm financially free and I've got passive income, it doesn't matter if I get disabled. I'm going to be fine either way. But until then, it does matter because if I got disabled, my entire financial blueprint is foiled. I will not build financial freedom with no income. Okay. Now, the other one here we're looking at is our auto insurance. If I got in an accident, I got six months in reserves. Cool. I might be able to pay cash for a new car, but I can't pay that person's medical bills. I can't pay for injuries. I can't pay for lawsuits. Like all of that stuff I need to have covered. Same thing with the home and the dental and the vision and the health and the life, all of that, right? So that's stuff that we need to have covered. And that's things, those are things that are just, you know, the basic responsibility of being a human being that has a realization on the ripple effects that our lives have and making sure that those areas are covered. Okay, so I'm going to get off my soapbox about insurance because, you know, it's, it's not an exciting topic, but it is necessary. Okay, so phase one, phase one of this plan we've already established is the least sexy of all of the phases. But think about where this brings you to. Okay, if you did phase zero, like there's no debt, we've got income, we've got savings, we've got our income insured against everything is covered, we're primed to then jump into phase two, which is the acquisition of assets. Okay, the acquisition of assets. We're going to start buying things that pay us now. Okay, but to start buying things that pay us now, when we aren't earning more than we're spending, and we have debt, and we're not insuring our family, like that's putting the carriage before the horse. Okay, I see this a lot, right? I see this a lot where like people that um, you know, invest their first five grand and, and they've got, you know, uh, $35 a month or whatever it is you earn on five grand in a real estate deal coming in. And they're pumped because they're like, man, I invested my five grand in this fund and it's awesome. And I've got passive income, but they can't pay their bills. That's not, that's not what we were going for. Right. Or, or the five grand I invested, I've got 35 bucks a month coming in and passive income and I'm a real estate investor and it's awesome but I've got a $5,000 credit card that costs me $300 per month. And I could have just paid off the credit card and I would have made $300 a month, not 35. See, these, these are the things that we've got to look at. The problem is a lot of us never get to phase one. And the reason why we never get to phase one is we skip it. I'm going to say that again. The reason why we never get to phase one is because we skip it. We go from phase zero. Everyone knows not to have debt. So we try and pay off the debt. We save a little bit of money, 
And then we're like, cool, let me go invest and buy a house and do all this cool and exciting stuff. And then we never actually build solvency. And it's going to sound super cliche, but this is literally the definition of building a house on a weak foundation. That $35 a month in passive income is not going to help you if you get disabled. That $35 a month in passive income becomes a liability when you lose your job and you wish you had the five grand right now, but you can't because it's a 10-year deal and you can't have your money back, right? So you've got to think about, am I skipping phase one? Okay, the other thing that happens too, there's two opposite sides. There's always two sides, skipping it or somebody never leaves phase one. They never leave phase one. I've seen this, somebody pays off debt and they're doing great and they get their six months in savings in the bank, and then they just keep going. Now they got 12 months in the bank, and then they got 18 months in the bank, and then they got 300 grand in the bank, and then they've got 500 grand in the bank. Now they're so terrified because it's a bigger gun than they've ever held before that they don't want to take it out of the bank because it's more money they've ever handled, and they don't trust themselves to make a wise investment. So they just keep doing it, and they never leave leave phase one. They don't invest. They don't buy a home. They don't do tax planning. They don't do anything. They just have a quarter of a million dollars in the bank that next year is going to turn into 300 grand and keep going down in value by 5%. We have to leave phase one also. Okay, so I want to give you permission to not skip it, but I also want to give you permission to leave it when you finished it. Okay, second grade is fun and cool, but not when you're 15, right? <laughs> like when you graduate the grade, leave and go to the next one. Nobody is impressed with the 15-year-old in second grade that knows all the answers. Of course, you know the answers. You're freaking 15 years old. You've been in second grade 10 times. You've been in phase one 30 times. That 3 million bucks in the bank is not impressive. You just never left, right? This is not always easy to hear because it disagrees with a lot of the emotional things that make us feel like we need to do this. All of this logic that I'm talking about, it's emotions. The reason why somebody would skip Phase one of building financial solvency is emotional. Emotionally, they want to be an investor. Emotionally, they want to buy a house. Emotionally, they want a better automobile. Emotionally, they want to quit their job and start the business that they've never made money at before. That's emotional. We don't make decisions with emotions when it comes to finances. Finances are logic. They will look you in the eye with your emotions and stab you in the gut and say, sorry, those weren't the rules. That sounds intense, but that's how it works. When I make an emotional decision on a logical subject, logic doesn't care. Okay, logic is not going to be like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you had bills. Let me somehow make magic income show up next month. No, logic's going to be like, dude, you didn't have, you didn't, you needed this much math. You only had this much math. Oops, who didn't have the math? Okay, that's money is accountability. That's where it comes from, accounting. Math isn't there. The math isn't there. You can't make math there. That's not there. Okay. So the other thing that's emotional is never leaving phase one. Okay. That emotion is called fear. Okay. The emotion that makes us skip it is called greed. The emotion that makes us stay there is called fear. Okay. Fear and greed are the two things that create more poverty than anything else in the world. Fear and greed. If I'm afraid to leave the bank, that I'm leaving my 300 grand with, guess what? They turned it into $3 million by loaning it out to 10 other people at the same time, charging them all 5% interest on 10 car loans. They made 50% on your money and paid you 0 0.10. And you're overextended on a 900% on a, on a, on a loan to value ratio and you think you're safe. That's called fear. Okay, fear is when we willingly suppress ourselves because we're afraid of what's going to happen. And so instead, we go to the master instead of turning into one. That's called fear. We never should operate from fear. Greed means that we, 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 ha we lack so much havingness that we have to go make decisions prematurely to go get something that we're going to get in due time anyways. And we end up jumping the gun out of greed and we end up making mistakes. Okay, phase one is where, where discipline is built. Okay, phase one is where discipline is built. We're going to save six months. We're going to get insured. We're going to do all of these things and build discipline so that when we start acquiring assets, we are actually strategic and level-headed. Otherwise, if we skip this, we don't have any of the character qualities that would make us wealthy in the first place. What did, what did we have really if we skipped phase one? We had the ability to borrow money with the ability to earn but not control our spending with the ability to 
prematurely direct money at things without making sure that we were actually solvent first. Those are all things that lead to someone being broke. Okay, phase zero, that's not really like discipline. That's just like, you have to do that. If you don't do phase zero and pay off your debt, you're gonna end up broke and bankrupt. There's a, a certain degree of accountability built into phase zero. Like I said, everyone knows they should pay off debt. Okay, but when we get to phase one, not everyone knows that they should have six months in reserves. They talk themselves out of it. Not everyone knows that after they have the six months in reserves, they should leave phase one because they talk themselves into staying. Okay. So guys, this is, you know, a very important one. And again, like the, the payoff of phase one is if you go there in your head where I have six months of expenses saved and I've got no debt and I've got all of this stuff covered and insured, it's getting rid of financial uncertainty. Like that's just complete peace. Like I don't have to worry and fear and all like all of that stuff is done. I can just go enjoy the money and build wealth and do something cool for my family without having all this negative and misemotion and stuff, right? So the payoff of doing phase one is just go there in your head and you'll experience it briefly, just the peace and calmness and certainty and security that you have that you can stand on your own two financial feet and make progress without having a government or a bank or another institution come in and play big brother for you. Okay. So what I want to do is I'm going to open this up for questions. We covered quite a bit tonight, even though it was just a couple small topics. Um, let me go ahead and pop up our questions. So I'm going to hit Instagram's questions first. If you guys are watching on Instagram and you have not asked a question yet, drop it in the comments. If you have asked a question, um, I'm actually going through those now after this sip of water and I'll answer your question. All right, let's see what we have on Instagram here tonight. Good to see everyone here, by the way, on Instagram. I love seeing Instagram uh, eager to learn about finances on a Friday. Uh, Blaine Huffer says, do you help people in debt? Um, Blaine, that is one of the things that we do. We help people get out of debt and we help you get out of debt in a way where you're financially solvent when you're done. So, um, to answer your question, yes, but the main problem with most plans that help you pay down debt is they don't handle the root issue. Okay. What I mean by that is they'll handle the symptoms, but they don't handle what caused the debt. What caused the debt was lack of money. Okay, so for me to say I'm going to help you get out of debt, but I'm not going to solve the problem of you have a la having lack of money, I can't really say I help you get out of debt because reality is, is you might go back into debt. So we do help you get out of debt, but we help you do it in a way that's permanent. Um, Blaine says I struggle with math. That's okay. If you struggle with math, math is a very easy thing to learn. And most things with finances are um, basic math. It's not like trigonometry. It's actually... Uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. All right, let me see what else we have here on Instagram. Again, if you guys have questions, drop those in the comments. Uh, I, I just had someone on Instagram call me daddy and then put a devil emotion. Uh, I don't think I, I don't think I really agree with that. Feta cheese is right. I help you make the cheddar. That's why my last name is Feta. All right, let's see here. Any other questions on Instagram? I don't want to see your diaper. Thank you for the offer. Now you guys on Facebook know what I put up with on, on my Instagram lives. Uh, a sweet word says excited to go over the blueprint. Would you like, I would like to talk about increasing earned income. Um, that's definitely something we go over on the topic of increasing earned income. Uh, that's definitely like we have something called the triangle of income. So it, it's not a confusing topic. Earning income, increasing income comes from having knowledge, value, and exchange. Those three things. You, there's so much like sales training and overcoming objections and all of this stuff. And that's all great. But the bottom line is I need to have value which makes me valuable. I need to have knowledge and I need to be able to exchange that with people. And if I can do all of those things, that is going to help me build more earned income. So just like 
I would say just go practice that, go do that, look for ways to be that valuable, knowledge, knowledgeable person that's exchanged with everyone else. And that's going to help you grow your income. All right, let me see if we got anything else here. Uh, so a sweet word says, when you achieve step one A and B, what are ways you would teach earning increasing income? So I think I kind of answered that um, on that question on, on the triangle of income. Okay, so that's all the good questions I see on Instagram. Um, let me go ahead and check out Facebook here as well. Uh, Facebook, thank you guys for jumping on. By the way, if you're watching this on Facebook, share this stream. This is something that more and more people should know about. Um, it's just basic finances, right? And it's not stuff we're talking about, we're, we're being taught about. It's not things that we hear about regularly. Um, Phoenix says, I need to get on Wealth Dynamics to ASAP and Slack in. Uh, been focused on generating more income, but I need to get focused on financial education. Well, Phoenix, that's a good point. So a lot of my guys on um, Wealth Dynamics, you, you guys are producers, meaning you earn lots of income, right? And that's great, but I've also got to get educated, right? Like I can work and do and work and do and hustle and grind and all this stuff, but if I don't get educated, it's always going to be hard work. The biggest thing I've learned this year is it doesn't have to be a hard work. I've doubled my income working half the time. Okay. That's, and that's not to brag. That's to say that's knowledge. Like that's the, the, you know, for you, Phoenix, I would say an hour a day on Wealth Dynamics U. Just make sure you get that time in. And, and if you do that consistently, you'll see that it becomes easier to produce and easier to build that wealth. Uh, Justin says, what are the eight insurances to own? Um, let me see if I, if I can list them off in my head, Justin. I'm going to try to really quick. So you should have health insurance. You should have life insurance. Um, you should have long-term disability insurance. You should have long-term care insurance. You should have identity theft insurance. You should have legal and estate insurance. You should have auto and home insurance. And then you should have liability umbrella coverage. So those would be the eight, eight types of insurances that you should own. Um, and those are all things we offer at Wealth Dynamics, by the way. So if you need help with those, let us know. Like I said, you don't probably need to own all of those at the same time. So I want to stress that. I don't want anyone to be like, oh, I watched Jerry's live stream and then I bought eight different insurances on Saturday morning. Like that's not, that's not, uh, that's not going to help you build wealth. It's going to cause, cause more expenses. Jordan says, what about student loans? Curious to hear a strategy on how to pay them down. So Jordan, we actually have a relationship with a, a company called Common Bond. Common Bond helps refinance out student loan debt. Um, so the first thing I would say is try and reduce your payment and interest rate as much as you can. And then we're going to use the sacred account to pay off the student loans. So if you've got like really high student loan debt, some people I've seen with 50,000 or 70,000 or 100,000, I've got a client with um, I think about 200 grand in student loans. We're going to pay that minimum and then we're gonna build up 200 grand in a sacred account, borrow against that, and then pay the student loans off in one shot. And by doing so, we've got solvency, we've got money, and he's also gonna buy that debt back. So he'll make the payment to himself and the entire time his money is still growing while he does that. Um, Josue says, is there any way we can get a copy of that blueprint to take a look at? Yeah, uh, Josue, I can send you that. I think I might have actually attached it to your actual blueprint. So you might have one already. And um, if you do, just check the very back page of your blueprint. You'd see it there. If not, let me know and I can send you a copy. Andy says, if I borrow against the cash value of my whole life policy, does the interest on the loan when paid back accrue to my policy or to a third party lender? Um, so and, Andy, that's a good question. We're getting a little bit technical with this. Um, so when you borrow, you're borrowing from the insurance company and using your account as collateral. So when you pay interest, you're paying the interest to the insurance company, but they're still paying you a dividend. If you set the policy up right, your dividend should be more than the interest you pay. So I should be making three to five. And then my interest should only be costing me maybe like two to three. So I should have that spread of profitability. Um, that's a little bit complex. So if you don't understand that, shoot me a direct message. I'd be happy to go into more depth with you on that. Uh, Jordan says, or should you try and avoid them altogether? Take the money from savings. Uh, so Jordan, that would be my first answer. Don't even borrow money for student loans. There's a course that I did on Wealth Dynamics University about student loans. And um, 
it's a racket. Like at the end of the day, you, there's only a 50% chance you actually get the job you go to school for. Um, the universities have something called an endowment fund, which means they're basically turned into a hedge fund. University endowment funds are some of the wealthiest funds in the United States. Yet their tuition inflation rate is 7% annually. We just said inflation is five. So there's no reason why they should be charging you 7% a year more every single year. So it is very, very much a racket. I would not borrow money for school. Um, I would even question if you should go to school. I didn't. If you need to be a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist or a chiropractor, sure. But if you're trying to just get a job or be a business owner, you don't need college. You can't learn about running a business from somebody who just read about it in books one time. Um, <laughs> not to be so blunt, but that is my, view, my viewpoint on college. Um, Okay, great. I think that that is everything I see on Facebook. Let me hit Zoom really quick and see. Uh, <laughs> Nano, I don't know what Asalam Alakalam means. I don't know if that's Brazilian or what, bro, but that's not that's not anything I can decipher. Um, Nano's in, in the comment feed on Zoom speaking tongues or something. Vanessa says, do the six months of reserves for your sacred account or a separate savings account. So Vanessa, you would do one month of reserves in cash and then you do five months in your sacred account and that would equate to your six months. Um, Nano says, what is the answer to someone who thinks they're paying a fee to have life insurance pay them three to 5%? Uh, Nano, I would not answer that person. I would say that they don't understand something. So I wouldn't tell them anything. I would ask them lots of questions because there's probably fundamental misunderstandings that person has about money because they don't understand that right now they're paying a fee to have money in a bank. Apples to apples, fair comparison. That really is what's happening. Um, and at the end of the day, it's about, do I have more money than I put in? So if I put in a hundred thousand in my sacred account over the life of the account and it turns into 3 million, it doesn't matter what fee I paid. I made money. Three million is more than a hundred thousand. So that's the simple math of it. Um, let me see what other questions we have here on Zoom. Nano says that means peace be with you in Arabic, your beard. Nano, is that an, is that an ISIS joke? I think Nano just called me a terrorist. Thanks, Nano. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, let me see if, if Instagram has anything else. Yeah, Instagram is just getting weird. I'm going to shut off Instagram. Guys, if you guys have questions, you can move over to my Facebook feed. Um, so guys, that's what I really wanted to cover with you tonight. If you have more questions on the topic of financial solvency and how to get there, um, shoot me a message. Okay, shoot me a message. I'd be happy to answer that and go over that with you. And the other thing to do is like, guys, this solvency thing and this wealth thing, it happens in phases. Okay, so do the phase you're on. Get through the phase you're on. Don't be stuck in a previous phase or so focused on the next phase that you don't do a good job on the one the one you're currently in. Um, and again, if you guys are watching this and you're like, that was great. I want to learn more about this. I'm going to drop a link for you. If you go to membership.jerryfetta.com, you can get a um, access to some of my video content. You get a two-week free trial to Wealth Dynamics University, um, and we'll actually give you a trial. You can go through and learn more about this stuff. That's a whole university filled with courses like this. Um, so I want to give... Excuse me, I want to give that to you as a free gift tonight if you were watching. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tune out here, guys. Thank you for watching. Make sure you like, make sure you share this, and we'll see you again next week. All right, Zoom, thank you guys all. Good to see you all. I'll talk to you next week.